and, and Zappi, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jess. Um, due to uh, time being limited to about 10 minutes, I'll uh, be aiming to whiz through this. So obviously in education, there's a lot of ground to cover and I won't be touching on some of the points you might be expecting me to, um, to talk to. Uh, a quick overview here, starting off with um, a couple of issues in education. Then I'll be moving on to um, a couple of issues on significance from my perspective relating to the object of urban design and the value of other perspectives. And I'll finish by highlighting the need for more than a single story and suggest, from my perspective again, some implications for action. Okay, in terms of ongoing issues, some quick definitions around diversity and inclusion. Words that we hear so often. Uh, diversity uh, is simply how we respond to differences in people, cultures, histories, and so on. And inclusion uh, is also very simply how we ensure that those others in whom we perceive differences are enabled to participate. That's the view I'll be taking here. Across higher education over the last decade and a bit, there has been this agenda to widen access to all levels of society with some notable successes in terms of the wider reach of higher education and the high proportion of the, of the population, uh, up to 50%, attending further and higher education. Disparities remain within that uh, proportion, particularly in relation to the recruitment and the educational outcomes of Black, Asian and minority ethnic students in the UK. So just moving on. This is an extract from the Mayor of London's Supporting Diversity Handbook. It's focused primarily on architecture, which is one of the educational fields that tends to be a major feeder into postgraduate urban design courses. And it's highlighting that the barriers to entering the profession can be seen at every stage of education, from application to courses all the way to part three. It's also highlighting the proportion of white students applying for a place relative to those accepted for a place compared to a similar pro uh, proportion of black students being accepted. And again, it's highlighting this point in terms of stages. At each milestone from part one to part three, there's a decline in the proportions of uh, BAME students qualifying for these stages compared to an increase of white students as you go, go through the milestones. Uh, various reasons are seen as likely contributing from the length of courses to the costs and so on. We won't be going into that um, on this occasion. What I'd like to focus on is this notion of significance, particularly in relation to knowledge. So what's the significance um, of these um, levels of attainment in societal terms? Is it mainly about social justice or is it about um, us being able to make a business case for why urban design should be seeking diversity and inclusion or is it just about um, uh, quality and professional uh, outcomes? Certainly from the standpoint of education and from my perspective, I think knowledge and what the discipline is aiming to build knowledge upon is really important. And a key critique of Cuthbert, uh, for example, in his paper reviewing the past 50 years of urban design was that in his view, there was an unclear academic basis for urban design in terms of what urban design's object is. Certainly increasing with the rate of urbanization, it's quite clear that urban design is concerned with settlements, their form and functioning, in particular, the urban, the city, as a key object of focus and research. However, we're still grappling with what a city is and how cities emerged. 
there's a list on this slide of factors uh, that urban archaeologist Gordon Child, um, in his uh, landmark paper back in 1950, uh, The Urban Revolution, uh, and what he termed um, the drivers uh, that were considered to be key to the emergence of cities. Uh, these were also considered to be uh, key criteria characterizing um, or enabling us to identify urban settlements. Some key ideas uh, there, um, just hi uh, highlighting those very quickly, um, the elite control um, of a, a sort of power um, elite um, within citadels, um, hierarchical social organization, uh, specialization, monumental architecture, um, and some others uh, around writing and uh, naturalistic art and long distance trade. Um, these have been tremendously influential in terms of how cities were defined for much of the 20th century. So what's the significance of these uh, criteria? Uh, sociologists um, confirmed and added um, to uh, Child's list from their perspective in the 20th century, um, coming up with uh, a sort of slightly broader um, perspective um, or criteria around cityness. Uh, while these have been uh, critiqued more recently um, in terms of the uh, necessity of some of them, and also uh, in terms of um, uh, what makes for uh, complexity, um, it's still a work in progress in terms of really defining what a city is. In 1965, Christopher Alexander's now classic essay, A City is Not a Tree, added to this debate by highlighting, in his analysis, a view of what the city is not. It is not a configuration or structure that is organized in a tree-like or hierarchical manner, according to his analysis uh, of organic cities using uh, set and graph theory. And he identified this hierarchical thinking in urban design and planning as being a key barrier to achieving complexity in new towns and cities. He thought that um, hierarchical thinking was endemic to um, human ways of organizing information. Uh, the cover shown on the slide here um, is of a new book, um, the 50th anniversary uh, edition of his essay, uh, which was published in 2015. Uh, it includes 10 chapters exploring what we've learned about cities since then and what we, we still need to learn. So, still on significance, but coming to uh, theoretical perspectives, on this slide, the main point being made here is that for much of the 20th century, there has been this single story about what a city is. There have been a lot of debates about which early settlements qualified as urban and which ones didn't. Particularly here, I'm going to focus on Africa. One of the prevailing academic views um, was that Africa was city-less in the pre-colonial era, that there was no indigenous urbanism, taking the earlier criteria we've just looked at into account. Even the Yoruba people in West Africa, who clearly lived in very large settlements for centuries before colonization. Again, lots of arguments um, took place about these not being towns or urban, as they differed in some key respects from the laundry list of supposedly ideal city criteria. And even Great Zimbabwe um, uh, ruins uh, in Southern Africa uh, were being attributed to, to some mysterious external builders from either the West or the East, anyone but the indigenous themselves. So the work of urban archeologists around the bend of the Niger River in Mali <clears throat> since 1977 has thrown such theories into disarray in terms of what they've been uncovering about early settlements in this part of West Africa. And since this work was done, even earlier settlements have been uncovered around that area. So what was unique about them? 
was that they did not conform to this hierarchical central organization. There was no evidence of any power elite. There were clusters, componential cities, with specialists that supplied a much wider hinterland. Their organization was what has been termed, more recently, heterarchical. Um, a much flatter structure in terms of the distribution of power. And they were notable for a lack of intersite uh, conflict. In other words, a lack of warfare. These were quite peaceful, very industrious, very dense settlements that managed to keep centralizing tendencies at bay. Again, this goes counter to the urban criteria that we've become accustomed to, to discussing within urban design and planning. So how do we go beyond uh, single story narratives in education? Some initial ideas have been put forward by Advance um, HE and various universities looking at what an inclusive curriculum might look like and what its components might be. The view is that it's really important that a diverse range of students can see themselves and their culture's contributions in the curriculum. This was something that was certainly lacking in my education. All the textbooks stated, or started, sorry, uh, with uh, Greece and Rome. Um, only rarely would they mention or have more than a few pages on ancient Egypt or cities in the East or in other parts of the world. Um, again, what's really important about the African example um, I mentioned is the way in which it has challenged prevailing theories around the scope of the urban phenomena and has encouraged urban scholars in some other areas such as northern China and parts of Mesopotamia to reconsider their data rather than trying to make it fit within the Eurocentric model. Okay, so the revealed diversity of data in the historical record enriches our knowledge of urban possibilities. So, um, nearing the end here, what are the implications? Um, I'll end with a number of questions uh, as potential discussion points. Are we educating new colonizers, uh, my term, in the sense that we're equipping uh, students to simply impose Western design principles globally. And following on from that, I think it's a positive move that many courses now have or include or allow uh, some student projects uh, to be based on other parts of the world. So there's a more global view of relevant projects. However, do those projects enable students to gain real cultural appreciation for the cities they're working in? What level of respect do they gain um, for uh, urban patterns and practices in those parts of the world? And to what extent then do the, do the curricula include a broad enough scope of approaches, both geographically and culturally, and looking at much deeper historical timescales? This was certainly um, a critique of Amos Rappaport uh, that was made back in 1990. How far have we got since then? Um, he was uh, lamenting and um, advocating uh, the need for environmental design to take account of a much wider scoped uh, range of case studies and looking much deeper in terms of temporal analyses. And in terms of process, how can we increase mentorships and role models across the professional educational journey? These have been shown to be quite important for encouraging students from disadvantaged backgrounds to enter higher education. And in terms of um, securing their retention once they're within the educational system. I'll conclude with some suggestions about including case studies or cases that explore diverse cultural urban design principles and urbanism practices. So that it's not just about doing a project in a developing city that has lots of problems <coughs> with informality, for example, 
While that is really important in terms of grappling with current uh, needs, however, to what extent does that still um, promote a view of cities in these places as always being problematic in some way? And not having an urban cultural heritage of, of their own uh, that is worth learning from or drawing upon in devising solutions. So helping students to adopt an inclusive lens in terms of the, the diversity within the historical context of cultural spatialities uh, and the range of innovations from various cultures uh, is something that's really important. This would help facilitate, in my view, a greater contextualization of the ongoing challenges we see with current globalization, um, as well as the acceleration of urbanization, uh, which is, you know, leading to uh, problems of informality um, and so on. So in terms of knowledge, uh, which I think is really critical to developing that respect for the places in which our students and practi uh, practitioners may work, and not just perce perceiving them uh, simply as places that are full of problems and lacking any sort of agency uh, or, or historical urban approaches of their own, <clears throat> is this need, I think, to renew interactions between urban uh, archaeologists with scholars of ancient, modern, and future urbanisms, so, so that we're really aware of and learning from the full temporal scope of urban examples in designing our contemporary and future cities. Thanks for listening.